Father, for uh, this morning. We thank you again for this great book that we've been able to to work through and um, explore and uh, and what it's uh, taught us and uh, what it's removed from us in terms of maybe misunderstandings about who you are. And uh, we just pray that you continue to uh, winnow us in, in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to do the last half of chapter 12, uh, and then next week we'll finish up with the last chapter 13. So um, the, this last part of chapter 12 is kind of the author's final uh, exhortation, final theological exhortation to the readers um, before he finishes up in chapter 13. And... Um, it's similar in overall content or subject matter to chapters 8 through 10, which focused on the covenant, right, the new covenant. But the emphasis is a little bit different. So in the previous discussion of the covenant, it was the relationship of the covenant to salvation, right, uh, or in theological terms, soteriology. I had to take a soteriology class at Biola. Um, which it's just comes from the Greek word for salvation. But now he's going to talk about the covenant and eschatology. Does anybody know what that means? Okay, the end times. Well, future things, basically, is kind of what it means, right? So he's going to relate the idea of, of covenant relationship to the future. And, you know, it's, it's very natural that he arrives at this because um, we've been talking about this race analogy, this athletic metaphor that he started uh, way back in chapter 10, the end of chapter 10. And we've been working through that with the Hall of Faith uh, and all the people that he lists in chapter 11. And then that culminates with the beginning of chapter 12. Uh, and so there's this picture here of, of all these saints uh, in the grandstands cheering on the readers that he's writing to who are struggling in the race of faith. And he says, you look to Jesus, right? The author and perfecter of our faith um, who was looking forward to the cross and then of course to glory. Uh, and so it's, it's important that he kind of finishes this metaphor off because where are we going, <laughs> right? Where's Jesus going as we look to Jesus? Right, and, and the whole point of this is to say, look, you know, you're not going back here, right? This is Mount what? This is Mount Sinai, right? You're going here. This is what? Mount Zion. And actually in the Greek, it's an S, so it kind of sounds very similar, doesn't it? Mount Sion. So I want to read that first part of, of uh, 12, 18 through 21. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So it's like he's saying, okay, look, you didn't start this race. You didn't go through all these hassles so that you could then kind of end up back where everything started. All right? You're moving forward. God moves forward. God's always moving forward, right? Even in, in the story in, in, in Exodus, in the wilderness, right? It's the cloud by night, uh, the cloud by day, fire by night. God's moving. He's leading them forward. And it's the same thing that he's doing with us and, and, and all people of faith. So because of what Jesus had accomplished as the greater Moses, the greater high priest who has inaugurated God's covenant promises, pilgrims must move forward in hope of the final establishment of God's kingdom and rule, right? So when we're reading these stories in the Old Testament, I mean, there are important stories. There are important stories about how God works with his people, but they fit the circumstances of that time period, right? 
Just like God, you know, God's revelation keeps moving on. We, we call this progressive revelation. And, uh, and he's moving forward. And we need to move forward with him. Or we kind of get stuck in the past. And it's even the same way when people talk about, you know, what's the future going to be like? Well, it's going to be like the Garden of Eden. Well, no, it's not going to be like the Garden of Eden because that was like way back here, right? That was like a newborn baby. That was where God said, okay, I'm going to start this and I'm going to form this and I'm going to fill this and then you form and you fill and I'm going to take a break. I'm going to create Sabbath, right? And so, you know, you got a lot to do. So when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, it's not about the Garden of Eden. It's about a city, right? It's a city that's like the Garden of Eden. So he doesn't play them off against each other. It's like, no, we'll take the whole thing. Eden, city, you build, you know, and, and we'll see what lasts because that's a topic we'll, we'll come to in a minute. So he never mentions Sinai actually in this passage, but it's, it's clear that that's what he's referring to. So I kind of put the, the passage next to the passage in Exodus on the right there where uh, Moses says, you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain when it blazed with fire, with black clouds, deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Then in Exodus, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people trembled and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we'll die. Okay, yeah, we'll listen to you, Moses, but you know, that voice, forget it. Um, anyone who touches the mountain shall be stoned, whether animal or man. So you see kind of the parallels there with, with the author in Hebrews. So you have all these descriptions about what's going on at Mount Sinai, the thunder, the lightning, the darkness, the um, we'll, we'll see later there's also an earthquake. And, um, and these are what we call symbols of theophany, right? Theophany means an appearance of God. And they're just kind of symbols of when God appears in certain circumstances, these kind of things happen, you know, uh, sparks fly. <laughs> and, uh, and you see that used uh, later on in, in other passages as well. So, uh, but then he wants to contrast that story with the next section in chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So he says, okay, you haven't come to this, and you're not going back to that, but you've come to this, right? Mount Zion, earthly, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. Um, and, and this is a theme that we see uh, throughout uh, various passages in the Old Testament. Most of us are, are kind of familiar with that from the book of Revelation, which we'll, we'll talk about. But the author has already prepared the reader for this because he's already mentioned this, this expectation of the city earlier in, in chapter 11. Um, all of the Old Testament pilgrims on the road of faith were looking beyond any earthly city. They were even looking beyond the, quote, promised land in Israel in anticipation of the future city of God, the new Jerusalem. So note, he says, Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is who? It's God. It's not David, it's not Solomon, it's not Nehemiah, it's not Herod, it's not Benjamin, not Netanyahu, you know. And indeed, all the saints were, quote, longing for a better country, a heavenly one, for God has prepared a city for them. And then in the final chapter, next, which we'll look at next week, uh, he kind of makes that hope universal to all believers. Here we... We Christians have no lasting city, 
but we are looking for the city that is to come. Now, this idea of a future New Jerusalem um, that we'll see in Revelation comes down from heaven to earth uh, is is something that's uh, especially um, mentioned in Isaiah. So the prophecies of Isaiah, various passages, I put a couple of um, common ones there that are used for that. Um, But then later writers will build on that. Okay, So if we're familiar with Revelation 21... All right, I'll read that first, actually, and go back to the other ones. Uh, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold. Twelve gates are twelve pearls. A street of the city is pure gold. And what John does there is he describes the new Jerusalem as basically the temple, right? So when you're reading Revelation 21 and 22, he says, I didn't see a temple. (laughs) Well, you didn't see a temple because the city is a temple, because it's described with dimensions that are square, right? A cube, which is just like the what? Anybody know? The Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies is a square, right? And so this whole city is the Holy of Holies. It's where God and the Lamb will dwell. But uh, John's not the first one to kind of draw on those traditions and to, and to build on that. So you have the book of Tobit. So I've been talking about the Apocrypha. So Tobit's a writer about 200 BC. He says, my soul blesses the Lord, the great king, for Jerusalem will be built as his house for all ages. Now, he, he means forever, not for like all ages of kids. Um, <laughs> the gates of Jerusalem will be built with sapphire and emerald and all your walls with precious stones. The towers of Jerusalem will be built with gold and the streets will be paved with ruby. Right? You know, depending how you, how you punctuate Tobit, Tobit there, and I did this in my doctoral dissertation because I did the use of Isaiah and Revelation. So um, you could almost make Tobit say the streets are gold. Okay, he doesn't say it, but New Jerusalem vision. So now we we move ahead a little bit to the uh, Qumran community, the Dead Sea Scroll community, right? All these people who moved out into the desert, Judean desert, who said, you know, Jerusalem's corrupt, the priesthood's corrupt, the temple's corrupt, we're not gonna have anything to do with it. But we are looking forward to a day when God's going to build a new Jerusalem and city. And so we have this document called the New Jerusalem Vision. And actually, there are other, other documents that they found in these you know, caves in the desert in 1947 through the early 50s uh, that talk about this, this expectation. Every street in the city itself was paved in white stone, marble and onyx. All of it was built of electrum and sapphire and chalcedony, and its beams were of gold, and its towers numbered 1,435. Now, Paul, even in Galatians, um, where he's talking about the difference between two covenants, right, the old covenant and the new covenant, or the first covenant and the final covenant, um, he uses this story of, of Hagar, and he says Hagar is kind of like Mount Sinai, right? Uh, in Arabia, and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem. But Sarah corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free, and she is our mother. And so he's he's using this idea of faith, right? Um, and particularly faith under the new covenant in Jesus there. So, so you have these, and then there are other examples I could, I could read of, of people who are talking about this expectation, right, of the New Jerusalem. Um, but I got to quote myself um, <laughs> at the bottom there. So John subsumes, John of Revelation, right, subsumes under the general theme of renewal a variety of important traditions, each of which evokes some aspect of the relationship between God and humanity. So we encounter motifs of creation and paradise, as well as covenant theology, the tabernacle and the temple, Zion, Jerusalem. John blends all of these traditions together into a theology of presence, God's presence, in which the restoration of communion between God and humanity inaugurated by the Christ event, and the Christ event it means the, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, reaches the final stage when God himself will dwell with them, right? So you have the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, Revelation 21, and God himself will dwell with us, not we will dwell with God, 
right? Direction's really important there. And that word will dwell. Okay, so in Greek, you have this word skene, which is a noun, which means tent, right? It's a tent. So then the verb, which I have on your sheet there, skenao, means to tabernacle with someone, right? To, to dwell in a tent or tabernacle with them. God will dwell with us, right? This is the story of Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, not us with God. It's the same thing in John 1.14, right? The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Okay, same word. The translocation of the throne of God and the Lamb from its heavenly status, somewhere, in Revelation 4 and 5 to the New Jerusalem unites the heavenly and earthly worshipers, inaugurates the universal authority of the kingdom of God, right? Thy kingdom come where? On earth, as it is in heaven. The final words of 22.5, they shall reign forever and ever, heralds the fulfillment of the expectation of Revelation 5.10, they shall reign on earth, okay? So this is this Emmanuel theology. And so it, it's interesting because when you, when you look at those themes, it's, it's so similar to what the writer of Hebrews is doing with talking about covenants and, and priestly language and, uh, and the New Jerusalem there. So moving to the back, um, we read that last part of that passage. So you, you're still kind of in this... Um, race metaphor, right? And so he talks about the welcoming committee when we get to, you know, the new Jerusalem. Um, so at the end of this marathon of faith, Tobin, you can put up those um, pictures. I was going to show these last week, but it works with this one too. Um, can you show the other one first? Okay. I've shown this before, but uh, so last summer or last May, actually, we were in Ephesus and... Um, and, and this is a, does anybody know who this is? Nike, thank you, Nike. The winged goddess of victory, right? So this is a, a stele that's, you know, from Ephesus, it's just right there. And uh, she's got a pen in her hand, right? And she's, what, what's in the other hand? A, a wreath, a crown, right? And she's waiting for the, the race to, to be over. And, and who's, who's the winner? Okay, I'm going to write their name down, right? And then after I write their name down, what do you get? You get the wreath, right? Which you can show the next picture, which is probably not made of gold. This was in a uh, museum in Turkey. Um, that would be a great, a great gift. But, but actually, as I've mentioned before, uh, the wreaths were normally made out of like celery. No, this, I'm serious. Celery. They would bind celery. Yeah. Or laurel. We've heard of laurel, laurel crowns, right? But they actually use celery you know, without peanut butter. Um, <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the marathon, there's a large, joyful reception. There's this great celebration you know, awaiting the runners. Angels in festal gathering, right? Everybody's partying, kind of. Uh, the assembly of the firstborn. So it's interesting, the word for assembly there is ecclesia. Does anybody know what that stands for normally? The church, the church right? Ecclesia, the church. But it actually was a, a generic word that was used for kind of assemblies of, of cities, you know, elders and so on. It's used in the Old Testament Greek translation um, for like a group of elders. Um, so... So a lot of the translations, if they're going to be a little more literal here, would, would say the assembly. You know, everybody's together. Of the firstborn, right? So it's, it has this sense of what, what's the firstborn rights? Um, you know, you're the oldest. You get, you, you get an inheritance, right? Just like we, we discussed the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, right? You get an inheritance. God, the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now that's kind of an interesting and it's a little bit of challenge there to understand exactly what he means because um, for the writer we, we already know that he is expecting a, a physical resurrection right a better resurrection 
which is physical resurrection of the body. But the word perfect that he uses, it's used all through Hebrews. It's a very important word for him, and it doesn't mean perfect so much as it means complete. Okay? And even Jesus was made complete earlier on, right? So it's something that everybody needs to be, <laughs> needs to experience, to be made complete. And all the saints, so he's referring to, you know, all these people in the race, right? Um, they're all partying with you and the angels and, um, and it's, it's the communion of saints. If you've ever said the Apostles' Creed, um, the communion of saints. Or uh, there's a hymn I used to really like, we don't sing it here. For all the saints, all right? For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, alleluia. Great. All right, you guys know that one. Um, I have sung it in heritage service, I think a long time ago. Um, and finally, who's last to greet the runners? Jesus. Yeah, the good Sunday school answer to every question. Um, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the pioneer and forerunner, but now the last in the reception line to welcome the weary saints into the kingdom with a better word. So, I mean, you notice, you know, at the beginning of, of Hebrews, the writer had talked about angels and what, what's the role of angels, right? Um, are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve who? Sent to serve us, right? So then the last, very last section of chapter 12 um, I'll go ahead and read that, 25 and following. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yes, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven the phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. That last little bit we'll, we'll talk about next week. He's just going to kind of unpack that a little bit more about what you know, worship means. But, um, but what we've seen all the way through this book, um, and, and you know, it's kind of like a sermon in a sense, is that there's this pattern, right, of gentle reminders, encouragement, but that's always followed by these very strong warnings and admonishments. Um, because they're they're in dire straits. They're 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 thinking of of turning back to this, right? They're thinking of you know, especially if we're thinking about Jewish Christians who are struggling um, because of their faith in Jesus, right? If they go back to Judaism, they can worship freely and not be you know suffer any kind of persecution. So. Now he comes full circle, really, from the opening message of God's final revelation to the Son. So we go all the way back to the very beginning of the book. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many ways and various, uh, in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, right? Okay, so yeah, all the way along here, God's been speaking, you know, he's been revealing himself to his people, but now he's spoken to us through Jesus, okay? And you can't give Jesus up and go back to this, okay? So don't refuse him who is speaking. Jesus is the better word, the mediator of a better covenant. There's no going back to the conditions of the first covenant. So as the writer says, look, if, you know, if you ignored the warnings Moses gave you, right, that was pretty serious, right? People got stoned to death for things like that. People got sent out of the camp, right? Um, so if you have a greater revelation in Jesus, right, there's a greater responsibility. There's a greater accountability 
in that. And that's kind of the point he's making there. Jesus is the better word, the mediator. If ignoring Moses' warnings concerning the first covenant brought judgment, how much greater accountability will there be for spurning God's final redemptive offer in the new covenant? And, and really all he's doing here is he's reiterating something he'd said at the beginning of the letter again. He says, therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard. And he's talking about the gospel there. So that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels, the message declared through angels was the law, right? It was the Torah. If that was valid. And every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty. How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, right? So we got to pay greater attention to this great salvation, right? So there's a lot of wordplay here. And, and then he goes into this interesting um, analogy of the shaking of the cosmos. Um, so to reinforce the warning, the author reminds the readers that the future day of judgment will reveal for all to see everyone, and what I mean there is every person and everything which cannot withstand the searching process of divine appraisal. So, so this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and, and Pastor Jeff was talking about you know, these difficult passages like in 1 John 5, uh, about the sin unto death, and how do you interpret that, and you know, what are the different ways that people can understand that. And it's the same thing when we start getting to eschatology and judgment language. Um, you really have to be careful because the, the, the scripture writers use a lot of metaphors, a lot of symbols, a lot of diff different analogies to try to explain things that are kind of unexplainable sometimes, right? And so we have to be aware of that. So, for example, the use of fire, uh, we find that in a lot of judgment texts. And, uh, and we'll, we'll actually talk about that when we get to Second Peter, chapter 3, more. But a lot of times, the, the use of fire as an analogy or a metaphor, is, it doesn't have the idea of burning something up completely. It has the idea of refining something. Right? And the authors are using you know, the idea of, of gold or silver and refining silver and a precious metal. And so you, you, know, you put it in the fire to burn away what? The dross, the impurities. And then you're left with something beautiful, aren't you? And, and, and that's kind of the idea of, of a lot of these judgment texts. And so we have to be careful about you know, over-interpreting them. And, and the writer's already talked about judgment, uh, final judgment in, in a couple of other places. I, I put Hebrews 4 on the sheet there. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing till it divides soul from spirits, joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart, right? Before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. So you, you see a little bit of this fire analogy in that last verse that we read, verse 29. Indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Now, of course, you know, if you read the burning bush, uh, he could be a consuming fire that doesn't consume, <laughs> right? The bush is still there. So, so what the writer uses rather than kind of the fire analogy is he uses the idea of an earthquake. Matter of fact, it's not just an earthquake, it's a heavenquake, Right? Because he's quoting Haggai, and Haggai says, I'm going to shake what? I'm going to shake the earth, and I'm going to shake the heavens, plural, right? And this goes back to this same story. I mean, he, he, he knows his readers are familiar with the story from Exodus. And, uh, and so in, in the description of what Moses is going through and the people are going through at Sinai when God reveals himself, uh, it says the whole mountain shook violently. Okay. This is another one of these fine theophany symbols. Uh, you know, everything's going on here, and it's, people are going, yeah, I don't want to get too close <laughs> to that. You know, hey, Moses, may, maybe you can go up there, and uh, we'll stay down here, and you can tell us what he said, right? Um, and so this idea of, a, like, the cosmic earthquake becomes something that's used later in other judgment texts as well. And so, you know, we kind of have to be be careful of how we interpret that. Um, 
And, and I suppose most of you have experienced earthquakes at some point. Um, uh, Steve, Steve Mall, and I used to teach at Puget Sound Christian College in Edmonds, and the college was in the old Edmonds High School building. Okay, so 2001 Nisqually earthquake. Anybody remember that? Okay, I'm on the second floor teaching a class, and all of a sudden everything starts to shake, and and I look outside, and the telephone pole's going like this, and 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 you know they rushed us all out of there. Steve, what happened to you? Yeah, yeah. Earthquakes get people's attention, right? Yeah. My wife grew up on Kodiak Island, Alaska. Okay, and we're going there this summer. Her parents have a cabin up there, and we go every couple of years. But she was there for the 1964 earthquake. Just a young girl. They went up on the hillside because her house was down towards the water, and a big earthquake. And then what happened? Tsunami. She literally saw all the water go out of the bay. You saw the bottom of the bay and then watched it all come back again. Yeah, it's amazing. And we were in Turkey last May and we went to Antakya, Antioch, right? And if anybody has seen some of these videos of what happened to Antioch, you know, in the big earthquake in Turkey. Beautiful city. Um, But we were staying in this five-star hotel, which was the latest kind of technology. It's one of the only buildings in Antakya today that's still standing. Okay? It's called the Museum Hotel. Beautiful. Um, So... You know, you can see the analogy going on here. God's going to shake some things up, right? He's going to stir it up, and let's see what what stands. Let's see what remains, okay? So that's kind of the the, the use of that. So it's, it's, it's like a sifting in a sense. So I brought, you know, my wife has these little sifters here. Uh, I don't know. God must have like a big, big sifter. Um <laughs> It, he, he sifts the creation. He sifts people. And then what, what, what comes back? What comes out? You know, what do we save? And what do we throw away? So it's important that we get both sides of that. You know, not that it's like a complete destruction of something. Okay, because that's not the writer's point. And if you start taking these symbols too literally, and you start putting passages next to each other from the Bible, right? You kind of get in trouble. So I put a few examples there, right? Psalm 96. The Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. Well, Hebrews quotes in the very first chapter of Hebrews, he quotes Psalm 102. Long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you endure. They will wear out like a garment. You change them like clothing and they pass away, right? That's another whole metaphor, which I've discussed in class when we did Romans. Um, But you have to be careful. It's another tradition to be careful of. So hyperbole, very important to understand how the the prophetic literature and, and, and how the Bible writers use hyperbole, right? Has anybody ever heard of that, the Bible answer man? Hank Hanegraaff. Oh yeah, go on YouTube and put in hyperbole or whatever. Right? He has a great little video where he talks about biblical hyperbole. And, uh, and I did a lot of this for my, for my dissertation because it, in Isaiah you have these passages that talk about the stars falling and the moon turning to blood and the sun doesn't give its light. And, and okay, well, when you study the context of those, they're all about historical judgment of nations, Right? It's used for Babylon, it's used for Edom, it's used for the Phoenicians, it's used for Rome in the New Testament, right? Okay, so obviously you can't take that language literally because if even one star falls, we're goners, right? It's even used for Pentecost, right? He quotes Joel, the moon turned to blood and the stars fell and... Okay, no, it was about God invading our space, right? And when it's like all heaven broke loose, 
instead of like all hell broke loose. So, so you have to be careful. Psalm 104.5, you set the earth on its foundation so it shall never be shaken. It's never gonna be shaken. And then in our passage, right? He's quoting Haggai. Thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, I will what? I will shake. Wait a minute. Who's right? Okay, it's poetry. Look at the context. Ecclesiastes. A generation comes, a generation goes. The earth remains forever. Isaiah 51.6. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, right? You just can't put those passages next to each other without looking at you know, the overall context and the, and the purpose of things. So, so then that last section, exploring the circles of context, right? So you always have to kind of move out from, from the passage there. Um, and I don't really have any room, but... Okay, so we have circles of context, right? Work out... As a matter of fact, you can, in this passage, you can even work out from the words, right? Specific words. Like, unfortunately, the, the NRSV and the NIV uh, in verse 27 says, yet once more indicates the removal of what is shaken. Okay, that word for removal in the Greek, it's only used in the book of Hebrews. It's nowhere else in the New Testament, okay? But it is used more than once in the book of Hebrews. So get your little concordance out and look it up and see how he uses it, right? Does it mean removal normally? Mm, No, it means change, right? The priesthood is going to get changed, okay? There's going to be a transformation here, an alteration. So I put a couple of, and it was hard to find other translations that I brought out that sense, right? So uh, the Phillips, J.B. Phillips translation, all that is impermanent will be removed. Okay, well, that helps clarify it. Um, he will sift out, and so notice this translation actually uses this idea of sifting. He will sift out everything without solid foundation, right? The earthquake shakes, and what's left? The good stuff, right? So circles of context. So when you're just reading that passage by itself, then you kind of have to work out to the rest of the book of Hebrews, right? Where else in Hebrews does the writer talk about eschatology or about the future or what his expectation is, right? And then even more important is, well, how does that fit in with what, you know, other New Testament writers say? Or go to the Old Testament, right? You see, you just keep working out these circles of context. So what else does the writer say about the future? The son is appointed heir of all things through whom he also created the worlds. Jesus was part of the, he helped create all things, right? And I've talked about that word in this class a lot. It's just one word in the Greek, it's panta, right? And it's a neuter plural, all things. And it, it is the way the New Testament writers summarize Genesis 1 and 2, Right? It's their way of saying all those things God created, (laughs) Genesis 1 and 2, right? Jesus is now the heir of all things. So if God, like, destroys the earth and the heavens, what are you going to say to Jesus? Yeah, sorry, Jesus, Uh, all those things you inherited, they're gone. (laughs) No, they're part of his inheritance, right? They're important. The world to come. He talks about the world to come in chapter two. Okay, so the Greek word for world there is the inhabited world. Okay, the world to come. That's actually a phrase from the end of the Nicene Creed. Entering God's future Sabbath rest. The promised eternal inheritance. A better resurrection. So now you can see it is physical resurrection. A kingdom that cannot be shaken, right? So you're receiving God's kingdom. It's his rule. Um, the kingdom of God, which was the central teaching of Jesus. is about the rule of God, right? It's what you pray in the Lord's Prayer. So it's really important. You, you kind of look at this broader context. And, and I'll close with this. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Timothy Keller, but um, Timothy Keller, great pastor, um, began a, a Redeemer Presbyterian Church in the middle of New York City, 
right? Difficult place to minister. But uh, was able to present the gospel in a way that was attractive to people. Um, musicians and artists and, and people and, and, you know, people, this, this church was just full of, of, of people who, you know, at one time were probably very cynical about Christianity. And he just had a way, an and apologetic, not, not a cheesy kind of apologetic, but just dealing with people's questions and answering people's difficult questions. And a week ago, he passed away from pec- pancreatic cancer. And years ago, I was teaching a class for SPU, and I, I used his book, uh, The Reason for God. And also, I've, um, I put some books on the back counter there. Um, Northwest College had me use a book on work, work and worship, um, which is really good. He's, he's just very, very down to earth, but, but interesting as well. And it was, it was fascinating because my wife and I were, were reading some obituaries and, and memorials to him. And then there were some things on YouTube. And like one of them was um, his heavenly hope. Okay. It's like, okay, so people could read that and go, oh, his heavenly hope, where is that? Hmm. It's like, is that somewhere way up there somewhere, right? Uh, and, and that's one of the problems with, you know, I get on my hobby horse with this evangelicalism, but we talk about death and what happens after death as if that's the final story. And it's not. It's the intermediate story. It's the intermediate state. And so if you were just to to look at that and and, and use that word heavenly, right, you, you give people and you give unbelievers this impression that Christianity is all about dying and going to heaven. Well, that's not what Timothy Keller believed, right? So I took a little quote from the reason for God there at the end. How then will the story of human history end, right? He's he's talking about the same thing here. Where are we going? At the end of the final book of the Bible, we see the very opposite of what other religions predict. We do not see the illusion of the world melt away, nor do we see spiritual souls escaping the physical world into heaven. Rather, we see heaven descending into our world to unite with it and purify it of all brokenness and imperfection. Out of delight, God created a universe of beings to step into his joy. He is committed to every part of his creation, loving it and upholding it, And though sin and evil have marred the world, so it is just a shadow of its true self. At the end of time, nature will be restored to its full glory, and we with it. The whole world will be healed as it is drawn into the fullness of God's glory. So, what he's done there and what I try to do in this class is, is say, okay, let's look at this whole picture, right? From beginning to the end. That God as creator, as alpha and omega, right? Is concerned about bringing things back to what he intended for his creation and for us as his people. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for these words from the writer of Hebrews directed to a very specific situation, but that still speak to us today through your spirit. Um, Help us to give uh, a good picture and impression of what the gospel is to those outside the faith. Help us to understand what our future is uh, within your creation. We thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Waiting for the way to wake me up from waiting. Do I mean it when I'm praying just to pray to see you move the mountains somehow? I don't want another way to move among the mirrors I'm protecting. And I'm never really claiming all the grace it takes to make a way with